Some of you may have heard me this, this, this morning, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, uh, Wendy asked me to say something about being an economist, how I found myself here today. And I suppose I've been extremely fortunate in that I've always enjoyed what I'm doing, what I've done, and that it's just been fun at work all of the time. I began off actually doing history and, and economics, and I wanted to become an historian, but there was no market in being an historian. So I've done history and economics. I got a job in the Department of Finance in Dublin in 1992. And I needed a job because I was getting married. My wife was actually senior to me in the Department of Finance. But she had to resign the day we got married because women were not allowed to be married in the civil service at the time. And it, 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 my daughter found this amazing. And it was in December that year we joined the EU. And the EU said, you've got to change the rules. Women have got to be treated equally. So if we waited to get married until the next year, um, she wouldn't have to resign. However, they took her back on contract because there were a number of senior women they took back. So for me, joining the EU meant that my wife <laughs> would get her job back, uh, which was, uh, given she was senior to me was important. I spent 12 years in the Department of Finance, um, and basically it was a fun place to work. The people, people who were interested in economics, they come to you and say, here's a problem that's come up. This department wants to do this. What do you think? Um, I'd come up with an answer and they'd say, you're wrong, um, and uh, somebody else would come up with a better answer. So I learned most of my economics actually in the department working with good people. Um, and after about 12 years I was told, if you want to have a career, if you want to be promoted, you've got to stop being an economist. And I said, actually, I'm not going to enjoy being an economist, this has been fun. So I left and moved to the ESRI where I've been for almost 30 years at this stage. Um, working on things that interested me, um, in that I've been able to sort of choose to a fair amount the agenda. So I was interested in the Irish economy, what drives it. They came along in 1990 and said, well, we've got a load of money to do research in energy. You know nothing about energy, but we need somebody to take it on. And I said, ah, that sounds fun. And I spent a fair amount of time over the last 15 years, 20 years, doing work on energy, which then metamorphosed into global warming, issues of global warming, how you reduce climate change in Ireland, pressures on climate change, and um, these kind of things. So I've been able to choose my own agenda to a very uh, 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 substantial extent. I've been exceptionally lucky, um, but being an economist has been fun. Um, and maybe I would have enjoyed being an historian, but I'm afraid there was no market in it. So. I don't know whether you want me to say anything more, but uh, over, over to you. I'm happy to answer questions on economics, the world. <laughs> yep. Yeah? Um, I read somewhere that um, in the Kenyan government are due to you know, be the first country in the EU to be paid back a bailout. Yeah. How is it that, you know, what systems did they have in place that you know, they managed to do that and what other countries haven't, such as Portugal or Spain? Um, I, well, I think one of the things was that we had, the economy was basically sound. The problem was a property market bubble and a banking system which was a disaster. And the, the, the business which actually makes things, or makes services and exports, wasn't badly damaged. So there was something to build on there, whereas in, in Greece, they don't export that much. So it's a much bigger problem. And Portugal, and they have a much lower level of education. And what they export is they're competing with China. And um, we're in a different market. So things did, were, weren't really as bad as it looked to us at the time. And um, in terms of getting out of it, one of the points which I made um, in the panel today was that the political system in a small country works differently from, say, the US, where it's highly contentious. In Ireland, the outgoing minister was dying. He knew he was dying, the Minister of Finance. And he wanted to, I suppose, play to history, to leave something behind. So he put in place a, a program of adjustment, which was, he took the tough decisions, announced it. Three months later, there was an election, and the government was completely wiped out. Um, but the program that he put in place was achievable. And the government subsequently, the incoming government, Enda Kenny, has been able to deliver and say, each quarter, they say, we've done better than expected because the target was realistic and was set by the previous government. Whereas if you turn to Spain, the outgoing government set an impossible target. And Spain has actually done an awful lot. Spain is actually, I, I think Spain has a real future. If you ever visited it, the infrastructure works. It's, it's, a, it's a place that works, um, except they have a 
serious financial problem and a huge problem with youth unemployment. Um, but in the Spanish case, the outgoing government made it difficult for the incoming government. And I think that in a small society, because normally the political system, I'm not familiar with one in New Zealand, but the job of the opposition is to say everything the government is doing is useless. But to some extent, um, when they are, they're off camera, um, certainly in Ireland, politicians will actually talk to each other across the party barriers. And when, it, when there was a crisis, they weren't together. So I don't know whether that's general, but it's easier to achieve in a smaller, smaller society. Yeah? What's sort of the overall direction that um, economists are going in Ireland in regards to, to climate change? And I guess as a small country compared to New Zealand, where what we're doing is fairly embarrassing, does um, Ireland also, I guess, play this, the people try and play the card of, yeah, we're a small country, we you no know, point in us doing anything, or, or are they getting on board with some of the more progressive EU countries? Well, the EU has decided, and there are rules, so we bought into that. So even if we want to stop the bus and get off, we can't. And um, so, in the sense that, as a commitment device, that's a good thing. EU policy has not been as successful. The EU would say, "Oh, we're doing great things." Actually, it hasn't worked as effectively because uh, basically the recession has been so awful in Europe that the emissions have gone down, and that, that has done more. But and if the answer is the world should be miserable, well then. That's not an answer that's acceptable. So um, one of the things which we're looking at is the EU wants to set targets for each country. But one of the problems is agriculture. New Zealand, like Ireland, has a very large agricultural sector. And 30 40% of the emissions in Ireland come from basically cows. And the only solution is you shoot the cows. Um, and actually, a, a Dutch colleague of mine who wasn't very discreet, we were in a parliamentary committee and I didn't manage to shut him up. And they asked exactly the question, the uh, member of parliament said, what do we do? And he said, well, you shoot all the cows in Ireland. Now, he was going to go on to say, actually, this is not a sensible policy. <laughs> but the politicians just heard this, and there was uproar. And I was trying to come in and say, actually, what Richard meant was, um, and what he was saying was uh, that the world wants dairy produce and cattle. If you shoot all the cows in New Zealand or in Ireland, <coughs> they'd be grown in Brazil, probably chopping down the rainforest. It will actually, uh, where you have grass based production, it is actually the most efficient in terms of global warming um, for, for um, dairy produce. Um, so, actually, if Ireland got rid of all the cattle, which might be a cheap solution to global warming, but the capital would be somewhere else, which would be actually more damaging to climate change. So, it highlights. It highlights Served, that you want to do things for the planet which will actually make a real difference in the world. And you don't want to do something which is just for a show. Now, it would be, it would cause uproar in Ireland if it had been uh, not as dependent on agriculture as New Zealand, but pretty good. It, it, it's still a big issue in Ireland. So, finding things which will work, and as an economist, I say, you raise the price of carbon and you make it more expensive to emit. And we have seen, actually, um, one major policy initiative which was more successful than government expected because they haven't done the research in advance, and for once they got it right without the research. And they changed the taxation of motor vehicles, which incentivized a huge change to diesel cars and to cars with a much higher um, kilometers per, per gallon, or per, per litre. Um, and actually, there's been a significant reduction in emissions just by changing the tax regime. And it didn't actually, people didn't end up paying an awful lot more for their cars um, or for driving, but it has reduced emissions. So finding smart ways through using prices seems to me to be the way to go. For me, I think I've been long for, since then before the problem hits, but I think it is a really big issue for the world um, and doing something about it. Um, it's difficult. A lot of criticism, people say, well, China's doing nothing and China is emitting more than anybody else at this stage. But actually, one of the things which will, I think, help find a world solution to this is that the people of China are being killed at an early age through the pollution. And to clean up the pollution generated by all these coal-fired power stations all over China, they will actually be cleaning up 
emissions, much less in terms of global warming. So I think, and it's been interesting actually, one of our experts was asked over to talk to Chinese expert, academic experts in this area, because China actually needs to get its act together on pollution for the people of China, not just for the world. So I think we're going to see a significant problem of global warming, but I am hopeful that there are other incentives which will make us all do something more. And certainly in terms of Ireland, I don't regret the fact that prices are higher and our recommendation is even higher prices uh, for carbon in, in, in Europe um, um, to, to drive change. Actually, one thing really interesting, interesting about New Zealand is that you have so much hydropower in terms of, and I actually visited the power station, um, I've forgotten what it's called, uh, a, a hydro station um, a, 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 a in southwest near Delphine uh, Creek. Um, and fascinating to see it produce 850 megawatts of electricity. But well, it, it, for the fact that you have so much hydro, one of the issues for Ireland, we have a load of windmills. The problem is when the wind drops, which isn't very often, you get no electricity. With hydro, it's much more manageable. Um, and uh, you would, you would, it might be a blossoming landscape, but having more windmills, I think there's one up above Wellington, um, would be much more manageable in the New Zealand electricity system than it would be in much of Europe. And um, there are loads of windmills in Denmark on the coast, but they're connected to Norway, which has loads of hydropower, and the two work very well together. So that's one thing where, where you, are, you are actually very clean in New Zealand in terms of your electricity production. In New Zealand, our electricity is very high, but, and that's always what is sold. But what we don't look at is that our transport and our industry energy is completely the opposite. Yeah. And we always like to look at, oh, look at our nice electricity, but that's only part of the problem. Yeah. Um, but then you're a pretty sparsely populated country. Finding transport solutions in New Zealand is not like finding transport solutions in Germany. Um, public transport. It's much more difficult to manage. And I see that you have very high car ownership, I think the second highest in OECD as a result. It, it, one of the things actually areas is electric cars, um, which my colleagues have done a fair amount of research on. And as a long term solution for the world, it may well be the answer. But it's going to be a long time. But the Irish government said we want 10% electric cars by 2020. And we said it will not happen for two reasons. First of all, cars last about 10, 12 years, actually 15, up to 15 years. So if everybody bought an electric car this year, it would be a decade before they'll all be electric. But the problem is the factories to produce them haven't been made in the world, and it takes about five to 10 years to build a car factory. So it's going to be 2030 before it becomes part of the solution, but that isn't a reason for not starting now. Of course, in the New Zealand context, the range of cars, electric cars, would be 50, 100 kilometers, which would be useless uh, uh, for much of New Zealand. So we need technical change there to, to, to make it a more feasible solution. I have one question about the um, GFC. Ireland's got in trouble because effectively the people bailed out the banks. Now, the banks are profitable again, having been bailed out by the public. Going forward, do you see the traditional banking model where the downside is socialised and the upside is kept with the shareholders as sustainable? It was a disastrous outcome for the people of Ireland and they are furious over it and that's the reason why they decimated the outgoing government. And uh, what should have happened was they should have guaranteed, they needed to guarantee parts of the banking system because you have to have banks. And the problem was we owned the our banks were Irish. And you in New Zealand, in some ways, it's a disadvantage, but most of the banks here are Australian. If you have a problem, it's Australia's problem, not your problem. And um, although whether Australia would be big enough to carry it, so. You, but the decision to bail out the banks, and Ireland was required by the European Central Bank also to pay off all the bondholders in the banks, and that caused people a lot of irritation. European policy has now changed five years on to say, actually, you shouldn't bail out the bondholders. Too late for the people of Ireland, we paid five billion to bondholders and banks who should have lost all their money. So there's a lot of upset over that, and Europe is rethinking its approach in how can you stop taxpayers having to carry the can if things go wrong, and putting in place a better regulation. And we were in a world where regulation was a bad name, now regulation is important. 
um, and also um, um, uh, so that you stop the banks being stupid. We kind of thought shareholders would stop their their banks being stupid. They didn't, um, and it's been disastrous. It's interesting to look at Estonia, a small country in Europe. They had a similar bus to us, but they didn't own their banks. They were all Swedish banks or Finnish banks. So it was somebody else's problem, and Sweden and Finland were big enough to carry the problem. So Estonia's banks back much more rapidly because they don't have a problem with, with the banks. Our problem today is though the banks are still not profitable. They have huge debt problems with mortgages which have defaulted. And it's sort of I'm actually on the board of the central bank and the big task is to try and restore the bank's profitability and eventually sell them. Hopefully some at the moment nobody buy a used Irish bank and it's worth nothing. But we want them to work <coughs> and sell them off by about 2020, but that's the objective. So it's a long way to go. Um, I have a question about education. I know you were talking about how uh, it would be beneficial if people in the university that have the skills to do the research mm -hmm. would do research focused more on what is relevant in policy mm -hmm. as opposed to their independent research, which is based on their incentives mm -hmm. and their career and stuff. And I was um, wondering how you think it would be possible because I mean I have like I studied history and law, and in both of those departments, um, I talked to lecturers who have worked with independent institutions as well as the government, and what they find the problem with working on particular government policy is that it, they often have to censor their work in certain regards. So I know, especially with history, New Zealand, New Zealand government has a particular view of history that works with its policy, and so they're not really willing to compromise a lot on that, so I see that as a massive, a bridge that needs to be gapped, because I totally agree with you, I think that's awesome and would be great if they could work on those things, but how does that relationship work in? Um, I, I think if you're going to do good research, you can't decide what the outcome of that research is going to be, and as I said this morning, there's some government departments in Ireland who are good to work with. I've worked with the Ministry of Finance, Department of Finance, for, for, for the last 30 years since I moved to the SRI, and they kick them in the teeth and they come back and fund more research. They do not expect you to come up with the answer they want. But there are a lot of public institutions who only want the right answer, who know what the answer is, and basically that's no good from our point of view. And in terms of academic research, if you, if you tell people the conclusions you want, then it's not going to work. Um, now, in the legal area, and actually it's one of the areas where possibly we should be doing more research in the legal area, because it's actually a big export of Ireland in certain areas. And there, you need to know what will work, what will fly in the courts, in Ireland or in uh, European courts. There's actually one niche area, which I haven't realised, that Ireland has a specialist expertise in aircraft leasing that an awful lot of the world's aircraft are owned in Ireland because the law will allow the owner to repossess the aircraft if the airline goes bust in a much more efficient way than if it's owned in most other countries. I don't understand a word of this. But as a result, there are law offices in Dublin which specialise in writing contracts to these aircraft. Actually, I don't like the idea of lots more lawyers. Sorry. Um, but maybe we have a specialist. Maybe that's an area where doing research and understanding how you can provide security, which, of course, will reduce the cost of leasing aircraft if people are secure and when they get it back. Maybe we should be doing more research in that area. I don't know. But when I said this, the idea that maybe we should have some more lawyers. So I love all. <laughs> Yeah. Um, in Ireland, when it comes to um, inventing or coming up with a new idea, do they care, do they focus on short term or long term? Because in New Zealand, they focus on short term. They set up the business or the idea, and they sell it off to some other country. It's pretty well the same in Ireland. And um, I mentioned the company that I came across, uh, which uh, 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 what they did was they developed this software which would so compact your mobile phone signal that they can put it, they can, they, it, they can use satellite um, with very little bandwidth. And every ocean going vessel in the world uses their technology to provide mobile phones in the middle of the Pacific. Um, but what's happened is, and I saw the guys selling it, I was in Vietnam and I saw the guys and I, I, he explained what he did and I said to the Irish official who was with them, that company is either 
they got to go global immediately, or they're going to sell out, or somebody else will invent the same thing. They sold out to Intel because they had a great idea, but they just couldn't go from 70 people in rural Ireland to a global company selling into every country in the world. And they sold in Niger, and all of rural Malaysia was using their technology. But they needed to go global immediately, and Intel were able to make it happen. So it's very difficult in the kind of, it depends on the, uh, on the inventions, but in a lot of the inventions which they're doing would be in software and a range like that, and becoming going global is not something that a small company can suddenly do. So I've seen other companies which have developed really bright ideas in Ireland and they're sold on. That doesn't necessarily mean that though it's lost to Ireland. What's be interesting to see is, do the company invent something new and uh, are they more successful? So, um, it, but it's, it's, the classic is, you yeah, have a new invention, yeah, build a huge company worldwide and you make money out of it. That isn't how it works, certainly if you're small. Yeah, we talked about the brain drain for an increase in the drawback mm. for overseas people to come back. Um, two questions. Firstly, do you see that as a natural problem, like a problem that can't be fixed in terms of payment issues that people do when they wake up for years and go to London and go to Australia? And if so, yeah, how would you fix it in the worst thing now? I think in the modern world, um, trying to say people should give a token on that. You're on to a loser, and as I said earlier, my three daughters are living abroad, so I've lost that one. The question is, hoping they come back. And um, even in the boom time, one in five Irish people went to Australia for a year to work. And I don't know whether they got anything out of it in terms of human capital. They had a good time. But the research which we've done shows that Irish people who emigrate and come back earn 7% more because they've learned something different. And they've they helped change Ireland. In, and in the 1980s, we thought that uh, there was a huge emigration of a particular cohort of young people. We thought they wouldn't come back. Actually, the bulk of them can't come back. And one of the things for us now, and for you, because it's a really big issue for New Zealand, the number of New Zealanders living abroad is huge. How we can mobilize that? Can you persuade them to come back, or can you make use of the diaspora? And the thing which Ireland has been particularly successful is making use of the Irish people abroad to help Ireland, so that they know if there's an Irish per person working in Siemens in Germany, they know who it is and what level they're at, or somebody working for Unilever, or somebody that you make use of your, your friends abroad and say, look, would you like to move a company to Ireland? And for example, the head of Heinz, uh, the Heinz Corporation in the US was a famous Irish football rugby player, Tony O'Reilly, um, and they actually located production in Ireland, which they might have otherwise. Ford, Henry Ford, in 1917, um, or 1918, located a car factory in Ireland because he was originally from Ireland. So that making use of your diaspora, A, trying to attract them back because they will bring back skills, they will bring back things that you have, have never thought about, and also making use of them as your ambassadors abroad. I think it's something which Ireland has been very successful on the, using them as ambassadors. And you have a huge number of New Zealanders living abroad. And um, actually this year, Ireland ran a thing which I thought was rather three or a bit over the top. They, 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 and the Kenny, the Taoiseach said, um, we are going to have the gathering in Ireland. I understand it has a different meaning in, 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 in New Zealand. But to invite back, invite back all your relatives from abroad, from the US or from where, Australia, to come back and just have a meet up in Ireland the year. It actually it seems to have worked. It was very good for tourism, but that's not a huge issue. But, and they've had a number of gatherings of Irish people who were in business abroad in very prominent positions coming back and saying, oh, yeah, well, maybe we could do something for you here. So trying to make use of that, the, 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 it is inevitable that people will travel. Um, what you want is them to bring something back, to come back and bring something back. And if not, can they help you as, as your ambassadors abroad? Yeah? Um, in your lecture this morning, you talked a little bit about how um, economists and just policy analysts can sort of communicate with actual people, the people that put those policies to action. Um, what's sort of been your experience in terms of 
uh, policy advising to local government, particularly in terms of housing policy? Um, well, I was married to a county councillor for 20 years. <laughs> it aided communication. Um, local government is different, um, but it's nonetheless important. Um, in the Irish case, because it's local, you actually know, you tend to know your local politicians. And on some issues, and um, there was one particular issue where the local councillor just sent me, this is a proposal, and I, in a paragraph that said why I thought it was mad that the council to spend money on this particular project, and the project didn't go on to you. I would have stopped anyway. So local government is different. Um, also, <coughs> the priorities are less driven. You have a lot of social issues, like social housing, how you prioritize that, where coming to me as an economist, I'm not necessarily going to have the answer. Um, but I haven't had that much experience working with local government, but I have had a lot of experience of answering the phone to people with problems, looking for my wife, um, or knocking <laughs> on the door, looking for my wife. Actually, we were very unfortunate <coughs> that our telephone number was one digit different from the local authority uh, uh, emergency number for sewage and water supply. So people would bring up and say their drains were blocked. And I didn't know, did they, were they ringing the county council, which they should have done, or were they ringing my wife as county councillor, asking her to ring on their behalf? So I dealt with all these problems on sewage and water supply, which probably weren't for us at all. It was just the wrong number. <laughs> So that's a real incentive for, especially young people need. But how do you compete with that when our economy can't? Well, I don't know that it can't. But it's not sustaining that kind of. That that is a huge problem, and one of the things that it did in Ireland was, and it's having an even bigger problem in Portugal. That you know, business in New Zealand has to get skilled people. And the alternative labour market is Australia. So they've got to pay a bit less than Australian rates, but they're, they're going to have to pay more in order to hold people. But the problem is that that will move up the skilled wage rate. But the unskilled wage rate, there isn't the same market. And this was a really big problem for our, in 19, the 1950s in Ireland, people emigrated and didn't come back. And the cost of emigration was huge, even to Britain, because you're going forever and losing contact with your family. So people would work in Ireland for 60% of what they could get in the United Kingdom. But with the changing te telecommunication, changing uh, transport in the 1960s, suddenly, by 1990, Irish people would only work in Ireland for 90% of what they would get after tax in the United Kingdom. And since then, it's been around that. If you could get 10% more in the UK, you left which leveraged up wage rates in Ireland, and it actually slowed the recovery of the growth in the economy. It's it, it is not something that is easy to deal with, and business just has got to pay what business has got to pay in order to get the people it needs. And it will impose costs on New Zealand, because it could lead to a, a widening of the gap between the richer and the poor, and it's a really big problem in Portugal. If you look at the OECD publishes data, um, what people with third level education get compared to people who least high school, to people who didn't complete high school. And if you look at Portugal, because they have very few skilled people, there's a huge differential because uh, if somebody from Portugal who's got a good qualification um, is marketable worldwide, um, but Portugal needs to hold them, so they have to pay their French rates minus 20%. And, um, I don't have an answer on this one, but it is a problem because you, if you can have a much higher standard of living somewhere else, that, that, that's going to be a draw. And you need to actually raise productivity. And that's why sort of, uh, Gerald this morning was putting an emphasis on this, raising productivity so you can have 
an Australian standard of living in New Zealand, but it's the long-term solution. I think also because Australia is so close, also you're not that far away from your family. I'm the sister who lives in Perth, and she comes over like four times a year. But that, 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 that's why we're part of the United Kingdom labour market, mm -hmm. and it's been less of a problem now um, in the last decade or so. But it was a huge draw, um, and actually, the government discovered that they had to cut taxes in Ireland in the late eighties because it was the tax rate in Ireland was the pay rates were a bit below the UK, but the tax rates were so much higher. And in order to hold people and bring people back, they said we have to match up what what the graduates would get in, in the United Kingdom, less a bit. And they actually changed tax policy to align it better with what was happening in the United Kingdom. So that you could have a better standard of living in Ireland, age 25, and our East of Standard of Living Commensure to brought to the office in the UK. And you see this movement within Europe. And um, it's a big issue for Estonia and the, the, for Latvia and Lithuania, small countries in the northeast of Europe. A lot of the skilled people came to Ireland, which really posed problems for labour shortages there because they could earn so much more in Ireland. You can't, we're in a global world, and you can't say, you are not allowed to go to Australia. Um, you have to, to, to make it work in the, uh, given, given the fact that there are those opportunities and say, yeah, but actually, one of the things Irish people traditionally, either when they got married or when they had children, are the last chance was when the children were entering secondary school. That's when you come back to Ireland because the education system, the primary education system would be perceived to be very good compared to the US. But you, you don't want to be dependent on the primary education system in the US so you come back to Ireland when your children reach that age. But, so there, there's more to life than just pay. Yeah? Uh, given that most of the US recovery has been built on their stimulus, and every time they go to taper it, um, the markets falter, do you think there's a way for the US to get out of it, um, to, to, to begin growing again um, once they decrease the stimulus, or is it inevitable to be in a fallback into a recession? And, and if this is predictable, how does then it come? Like and shield itself from disaster um, For us, US economy and its success is hugely important. Um, uh, and I think that they could taper at this stage, and yeah, you would see some kind of slowdown. But the US economy is in recovery. The problem is that political system and the budget. Are, we're going to be back into um, are, are we going to lay everybody off again in January? Um, it is sorting out their fiscal problem, which is causing real uncertainty to the rest of the world. It's a real cost. And people talk about Europe not working properly. The US does not work properly at this stage. And the problems in the US political system are impacting on us all. Um, and so I am concerned to see the US find some kind of resolution, which um, I just I have two colleagues, and one of whom is American, and the sister was laid off, and she was in the Central, which deals with potential epidemics in the US, so look, it's not to be plagued with the wet, break out, because all the epidemiologists have been laid off. And, and the crazy thing is, they then pay them off and they take them back on it. So it doesn't save the state any money, it's just they don't do the work. So you could end up having public servants um, in a year spending two months laid off doing nothing, and um, with less output in your, uh, uh, sorry, but I shouldn't comment on the US, but this is, <laughs> it isn't helpful to the rest of us in the world. Yeah? So you talked about like the massive uh, investment I made in education. Mm. So I wonder if you could just kind of talk through how that was affected mm. uh, and what it meant for uh, the, average, you know, the Irish student, particularly the tertiary yeah. uh, well, student. What was in, in 1992, we did a microeconomic study where we looked at the probability of being unemployed. And somebody who had left school with no qualifications was going to spend half their lives unemployed, just there wasn't room in Ireland for them. And there were an awful lot of kids leaving without qualifications. And we worked out how much the state would pay in social welfare over their lifetime to these people. And it was a huge sum of money. And the government said, actually, we could save more money on measures which actually kept kids in school so they could do high school than spending it on third level. It was probably the most productive thing they could do. And they actually reduced the school early leaving, it's down to, uh, it, 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 girls, they were pretty successful with, and um, girls remained on to teach high school. 
boys, the problem was they were leaving um, to go into building construction. And we knew that that wouldn't last and they would be then unemployable when they left. They, they achieved a very substantial reduction now in early school leaving in, in Ireland. And that probably is a bigger return than third level. They've really cut back on funding for third level and there's an issue there of should there be more fees or whatever. I'd be concerned about the policy of third level that it has been affected. Now, primary education, the policy has not been affected by the crisis, and probably not second level. Um, but um, I think they, they need to have another look at third level. So for much of that period for the average tertiary student, mm -hmm. was education free? Um, it, the fees would be currently about €2,000. It was free in the 1990s, um, and, uh, and they put up the fees gradually, sort of 500 or 1000 2000 And 2000 is quite a lot of money, but compared to the other costs of going to university, and the, one of the big issues now in Britain, I think it's 8000 sterling for it to go to university, which is um, uh, it's six times what it is in Ireland. And Scotland is free for people from Scotland. Ironically, Irish people can go for free to Scotland, but English people can't go for free to Scotland. <laughs> Under EU law, if you're a foreigner, like if you're a Latvian, you can go for free to Scotland, but if you're English, you can't. It seems bizarre <laughs> to me. So as an sorry, yeah? so as an economist, would you advocate free tertiary education? I th I think because the returns are so great to the individual from third level education, that actually making some payment is correct. But if you charge the full economic cost, I mentioned this afternoon, for example, engineering, that you probably should charge 8,000 or 10,000 a year to do a good engineering course in Ireland. What will happen is kids will say, I couldn't afford that. And I would know if you do it, you're likely to make it back over your lifetime. But your time horizon, you are going to be risk averse. The idea of taking on, as they, people do in the US, in the, the, the US system, I would rule out a lot of Irish people who are too risk averse, they're not used to it. So charging the full economic cost would be problematic. And one area would be medicine, where um, medicine is incredibly expensive. Um, and at the moment, Ireland is a problem with not having it not. They're producing loads of doctors, but they're all going abroad because the system is dysfunctional. My daughter is, well, she's currently working as a doctor in Bangladesh, but she's going back to the UK to work there because the system works. In Ireland, she would have been paid 50% more as a doctor in the last five years if she'd worked in Ireland, but she just said the system is a dysfunction, which is interesting that like, it's, it's not just money that drives people. And, 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 and for her, and I've met some of her other Irish friends who are doctors in Britain, they say the system works much better. I'd much prefer to work here. I could earn a lot more in Ireland. We need to sort out the system. Yeah. All right. I, 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 I'll go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to hear a little generally about how you find working as an economist in, in the EU. So you heard on the, on the panel someone speaking about the need for, you know, have economists with a broad range of of ways of thinking about it, different theoretical lenses and that kind of thing. Within the EU, is it how heterogeneous is it? Is it are there certain um, fissures within the EU in terms of the frames and what's it like working in that kind of environment? Um, for me, it's exciting and it's been over most of my career because of cultural diversity. We're dealing with people, that everybody speaks English if they're going to economics, but you're dealing with different. I actually, I, I speak French and I actually have to use French some of the time. And, and the French comments are less likely to speak English than anybody else. And, but it is working things, doing things differently. And, and <coughs> next week when I go back to Dublin, we will be producing with nine other institutes in Europe an assessment of fiscal policy in Europe, how much is being taken out of the economy by the governments of Europe. And it's very interesting to work with my German colleagues, and they have a very different view of the world, but we can reach agreement with them, the National Institute in London. I find it fun. And, but we are very Eurocentric. And one of the reasons I, I jumped at the opportunity to come to New Zealand and see, look at the world from a, a broader context. Um, and I understand, actually, the Irish Minister, Ministry of Foreign Affairs has sent somebody to New Zealand that we're interested in your expertise, how you view the world, and your outlook on the world is rather similar to ours. 
you know, outside the EU. And maybe maybe we should be looking at we speak English, we have the same legal systems, and uh, maybe we should be doing more things together. Um, so it, 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 it's a two-way process, and trying to look at the world from outside the EU is very important, and we are very Eurocentric. Euro um, you talked about how a part of the uh, solution that the Irish government has used to combat the problem of um, uh, skilled workers going overseas has been to uh, allow for immigration of skilled workers from other countries to bring in new ideas. Um, in a country that's more nationalistic than New Zealand, um, what are the sort of social implications of that? Um, it's very interesting that one of the things about Ireland has been a curiosity because of its disaster. So we've had journalists coming from all over the world. And it's the time of the US magazine Time the correspondent in London has come a number of times. And the last time she came, she said she was fascinated. She covered Europe for a time. And she went to a factory in rural Ireland where it had closed down. She wanted to talk to some of the people unemployed about what the experience was. And she talked to two women and said, oh, it's awful, lose their job and so on. She got some good quotes. But the thing that really struck her was that two women independently said, but it's awful for us, but it's worse than the poor Polish people who lost their jobs. And she said, anywhere else in Europe, if you interviewed, people would say, the foreigner is the problem, they should go home. And I don't know why it is, but I do actually know some of why it is, that the immigration to Ireland has been predominantly skilled. So the research we've done shows that people who come from abroad are less likely to draw welfare. And as our EU citizens are, they have equal entitlement to Irish citizens. They tend to go home or go somewhere else for a job. So they are not seen as being dependent on the state or a cost to the state. Also, the 2001-6 census showed that 15% of all children aged between 0 and 5 had one parent who was Irish and one who was not born in Ireland. So the inter social integration in Ireland of foreigners, and one of the, one of the things that I look one part of my colleagues will be from outside of Ireland, but one of the problems is how we make them stay, and romance is very important. Now, you can't, as an employer, organize romance. But when, sort of, a, a German colleague I discovered, why was she coming to Ireland? She's really good, but she had an Irish boyfriend, subsequently got married. So, it, 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 when, when you have in, when integration occurs at that level, whereas you would have in Spain a lot of the building workers there who from Africa, they're unemployed. They're so much better off being unemployed in Spain than in Africa than they're going to go back. And it is causing a lot of tension. You have a lot of tension in the Netherlands, which is difficult to understand, but where you have immigrants who are dependent on welfare, who are not as skilled as, as the domestic population to cause tensions. And there's problems with integration. The great thing about Ireland is we speak English. That Immigrants who come to Ireland actually want to learn the language, but immigrants in Sweden, like in, a lot of Kurds went to Sweden because they couldn't get into the US, they don't want to learn Swedish, they don't want to anywhere other than in northern Sweden where the climate is awful. Um, so integration is easier, um, um, and it's something in New Zealand that, that people would be happy to learn English, whereas if you were going to, to Malaysia, um, to, you wouldn't really want to learn Malaysian, would you? Um, because it's not a world language. So. Uh, there are issues there in terms of integration. I'm just going to stop you for one moment. You're allowed to choose. So yes, thank you. you. <laughs> and look, I just want the last probably four or five questions from people who haven't asked any questions. So go for it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you spoke a lot about uh, increasing productivity. Um, and so if you were the Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, what would you do? increase productivity in New Zealand and just as a backdrop um, there's research showing that when the All Blacks lose <laughs> productivity in New Zealand goes down by 8% <laughs> yeah but it you could lose to Ireland just once please <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have an easy answer on productivity I was interested I watched your Prime Minister um, yesterday morning on television talking about the problem of course and uh, it's fascinating because we have an identical problem and I'm not quite sure what the answer is. Um, and the problem here is that chorus is not rolling out broadband as the government would like. 
and it looks to me as if financially they're too indebted to do so. And we have the same problem. Our, we privatised the utility, we didn't regulate it properly, it was leveraged up the hilt successively, it's bust and can't fund the investment. And then should the government fund it or how do you deal with it? And it's important for productivity. Although I must say, I didn't complain about it. I was in past and I had to finish off a report. Really, I didn't come to New Zealand to finish off a report, but I had to finish off a report on the economics and wind days. And I found myself in past being able to. I don't know, the internet was fine from my point of view, that there was good connection and working working in, in basically in Ireland from past. So it is important in terms of productivity and given the remoteness of New Zealand and um, communication with the outside world. But um, how you contribute directly to productivity, it's a whole series of small things, and I don't, I would not presume to advise on that. And you talked a bit about how Ireland had kind of quite a good comparative advantage in Europe in terms of software and IT and kind of not exporting yeah. heavy goods, whereas New Zealand is kind of similar. What, where do you see New Zealand kind of going? Where we don't kind of have a similar tax regime to kind of attract like the same numbers of companies, but we are at the moment we've got a lot of international companies outsourcing because we're kind of cheap to you know have their call centres and we'll be operating in the other in an inverse time zone for them. But how do you see us growing from that? Because obviously that leaves us quite open to issues of um, call centres are attractive that you're easier to understand than India and um, you're yeah. you're completely the opposite side to Europe in terms of time zones so you have advantages. But in terms of skills, it doesn't require huge skills. It's not something that you want to make the centre of your economy. You want interesting jobs. I've had an interesting job. You all want interesting jobs. So you need to provide interesting jobs to keep you here so you don't go to your sister in Australia. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the answer is, but it is, it, it is rather than putting all the resources in, and, and it's great to see call centres coming because you, you need uh, a wide range of jobs, but the effort needs to be put into things that are going to be longer lasting and bring more skills and make use of your specialist expertise. Um, in New, New Zealand has something that other places don't. You have skills and uh, uh, make use of any cultural diversity that you have. And one of the issues in Ireland is you can't get people who speak any other language than English, so we've got to import them all. Now, uh, New Zealanders, I'm told, are not great at learning other languages, but you have people who've come to New Zealand from elsewhere, make use of them, and to build companies which are selling into a much wider market. And, and the question you about cultural diversity. Um, what, do you think that cultural well-being is important in terms of people's living standards? Yes. And in Ireland, Irish people will move to Dublin. And foreigners will move to Dublin. And foreigners might actually go to Cork, which is a city with a population of 200-300 thousand to the south. But the place that people, people from Dublin will go and work is in Galway. And why go away? It's a population of 50,000. It's a small, small town by world standards. It's seen as being an exciting place for young people in terms of music. It has two theatre groups, which are the Druid has frequently played in New York, uh, very successful. It's perceived to be a culturally exciting place and sort of good music. Um, and therefore people, they may actually never go to the theatre when they go to Galway, but they think, actually, I'm going to an exciting place. So it is creating that environment of actually, Wellington is an exciting place, or Auckland is an exciting place to be. So the foreigners, and even people in New Zealanders say, actually, much more exciting than going to Sydney. It is, and that isn't about money, it is about other things. And don't ask an economist how to make a place exciting. <laughs> Some other skills for that, and it happens by accident. But I, I do think that the, the broader cultural issues on standard living is far more than just the pay. And if you can't do the pay, do everything else. Um, I was just a brief, if you could answer, Tara. Okay. Um, from a personal perspective, when you're judging in economic policy. Apart from economic growth, what do you find as are the most important factors? Um, we, 
I, when we were doing work for the Bank of Finance on assessing plans, we, or if we had to look at what would maximise growth. We also had to look at the distributional effects because there would be disadvantaged groups. Was it going to hit? Was it going to be, have a positive impact there? Was it going to have a positive impact in the environment? And we'd use kind of a scoring system that if something was really good for economic growth but negative on social consequences, you would mark it down. So public policy there are multiple objectives, and it's difficult to match those objectives because that's a political decision. But you really do need to say, yeah, there are things that are more important than economic growth. And, and how you, in a sense, that that is for the political system. One of the things, I'm on the board of the Central Bank of Ireland, and I was previously um, not regulator for electricity in Northern Ireland. And the problem as an electricity regulator was that law said we were to minimise the cost for consumers, that's fine, but we were also to maximise the reduction in carbon dioxide emissions in Northern Ireland. The problem was, it was a political decision of, are we going to impose more costs on consumers to uh, improve the environment? And really, that's a political decision which should be left to politicians, not to regulators. So there, there, I know what answer I as a person would come up with, but when you're putting, uh, 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 and that's why you need politicians to make these decisions, but you don't make it just on economic growth. There's a lot more to life than that, as I think. I suspect that's where your answer was from, question was coming from. Um, this is just a follow on from the cultural diversity question. In the sphere that you work in, particularly, what is it like with um, gender balance? Because I noticed today that all the speakers were male. Um, <laughs> the, the director of the ESRI is a woman. The assistant director who just retired was a woman. But on um, the whole. Um, in economics um, in Ireland now, the majority of the cars would be women. And um, economics is, um, uh, is, it is not easy being a woman, as you know. Uh, <laughs> but, and I told you, my wife got fired for getting married, and, and, but that has changed. The Irish political system would be very male dominated. And um, my wife was a politician, but she didn't last long. And um, she had a good time when she was a politician. But um, in economics, I think that things are changing um, as a profession. And one of the things I'm interested in, we've heard recently, we have three Italian women who joined us. And talking to them, one of the reasons they've come is it's very difficult for young, really good academics in Italy to get a job unless you know somebody. They spoke good English, and it's particularly difficult for women. And they were happy to come to Ireland because they felt that they'd get a, a fair deal in Ireland. And um, now, unfortunately, one of them is married to American, and then moving to Washington. So, sorry, I'm just going to check any more questions from people that have announced questions. Yeah. Well, when you were talking earlier about I make really good use of it. Um, it became part of policy and it happened to begin off with accidentally. Because in particular in the United States, because Ireland was neutral in the Second World War, and Ireland was a bad name in 1945, and President Kennedy's it was his election in 1960 changed it because he, 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 he advertised his Irish background, came to Ireland. And from that date on, I would date a big change in the US. And um, also, Irish people, uh, our people of Irish extraction, were moving up from being at the bottom to, he, he, he symbolized us reaching positions of prominence. And since then, Irish government have made very extensive use of the political lobby in, in Washington. Second only to the Israelis. In fact, there's an interesting book by the British ambassador in Washington in 2000-2002, and the continuing refrain is the nightmare of those bloody Irish. They get to the White House before he does. And he decided he was going to try and establish a Scottish identity, which meant he had a big party in trying to attract all the people with Scottish origins to the British embassy wearing kilts. Now, I think that was rather off putting myself. But um, so that the, the success of that lobby in Washington, so that if there's legislation on the House which is going to be unfavorable to Ireland, they move in and will generally get, get a change. So um, that 
the, that, that use of the diaspora politically has been really important. And in terms of bringing this resolution of the problem in Northern Ireland, Mrs. Thatcher was not very sympathetic. Reagan rang her and told her to sort it out, and she did. And um, now, subsequently, it, it worked well. Actually, one, just one, because I better go, one anecdote. Reagan was discovered that he was from a village, and he, he even discovered that Obama has Irish ancestors. And so every American president finds their ancestors and get them to come to Ireland to visit the ancestors. But Reagan was invited to dinner at the Irish Embassy, and it would be very unusual, but the president used to be accepted and went. But that morning, there was a massive storm, and a tree was blown down, which blocked the entrance to the embassy. Nightmare for the ambassador. Got in people with chainsaws to hack away so that the beast with the president could get through. Reagan arrived at dinner and said, I see a tree is falling. Um, I like chopping up trees. Would you mind if I come back and chop it up? And he came back on two subsequent occasions with a chainsaw to chop up the tree in the Irish embassy. <laughs> now, in terms of access to the president, it's very difficult to get that level of access. So that in the US, it's been particularly important over the last 40 years. But it's something which is worked upon, and it took a long time to build up. We have one last question. Right? Um, yeah, so just going back to the sort of cultural diversity um, topic we get, um, trying to sort of, I guess, cover all the different types of cultural perspectives, how do you find that, like, in New Zealand, we have a whole array of different cultures, so is it the same sort of problem in Ireland, do you have to, I mean, to deal with those sorts of issues? Right. Because most of the people, with the exception of people who came to work in the building industry, most of the foreigners working in Ireland speak good English. Actually, it's interesting that a colleague um, who began off, a Chinese girl working in canteens, um, really good English, um, and she now does her accounts. She's qualified as an accountant, and we actually have her on a reception some of the time because she actually is very good with people. So it is having people who can integrate easily makes it it's been easier in Ireland <coughs> um, but it is a question of language and um, if you can't speak the language <coughs> and a lot of people in the building industry who didn't speak good English lost their jobs and they went home then they're, they're, they're on point rate is slightly higher for foreigners than for Irish people but not much not that much and um, because as I said earlier they tend to want a job and they can get a job anywhere, so they will move on if they don't get a job in Ireland. And so it's, but I just think it's been, Ireland was a boring place in the 1950s, and it was a much more exciting place today. Well, thank you. <coughs> and just before we go, Kilda, and thank you so much for coming and talking to us. I know everyone in the room is listening to and enjoy yeah. hearing about your stories, especially about the um, storage room. <laughs> um, and also, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. We've really appreciated it. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. I'm sorry I'm not here longer, but I'd get boring if you I was here another minute. We're going to be here for Cousin Bells, have we guys? Yeah. Thank you. I'll walk you out. Thanks very much. <laughs>